you line by line and basically you're saying to the actor, okay, read this line three different times and uh, angrier. This time with more passion. This time uh, as if you're uh, standing at the edge of a pier, you know, where you have to yell at somebody on a boat. So you're, it's far away. You know, you kind of help them with that. And that's how you direct them. And it's very, it's very playful and it's very uh, nitpicky. It's very uh, micromanagey. At, at least that's how I direct it. It's very micromanagey where you're basically telling people, because I have a way I, I hear it in my head and often they can come up with something better. In, in that case, we'll use that version. But we're, we're, we're trying to get we're trying to get something specific. And then I'm just trying to pull it out of them. You're listening to Screenwriters Need to Hear This with Michael Jen. Hey, everybody, welcome back to Screenwriters Need to Hear This, the podcast where Phil Hudson and I talk about all things uh, that screenwriters need to hear. Uh, today, the only only things they need to hear, nothing else. Nothing. There's no extraneous stuff like that. Uh, today we're talking about directing voiceover talent because I always I think people are interested in, in how that works. Yeah, so, it's, a different, it's a completely different craft, right? Voiceover for animation versus directing. Yeah, for right. Live live, versus live action. It's very. Uh, I think people are surprised to hear how it works. So um, we're gonna go into that. So first, first thing, how it goes, and I'm sure it varies from show to show. On the couple of animated shows that I've done, this is kind of usually how it works. And I'm not talking about the regulars. I'm talking about like guest stars, people who come in for a scene or a couple of scenes or whatever. Very often, we, the showrunner, you, in live action, the showrunner would basically cast everybody. The, 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 the uh, casting director would read a bunch of people and choose the best five or 10 to go read for producers. And producers are basically just high level writers or the showrunner or whatever. And, and then... That's the audition session, and then you know the producer will choose the best person to get the role, whoever's right for the role. And live action, it's a little; it can be a little different. Sometimes it goes that way, where we audition people, but just as often as not, uh, we'll trust the casting director. Hey, you know this casting director has worked a lot in animation. You cast the part. You know what it is. You read the mm. script. You cast it, and then oh, you know that person will show up to the first day to the record session, which is the recording booth that we rent out, and. You meet, you know, you'll meet the cast for that person for the first time. Oh, welcome to the show, and um, and you talk to them for a bit. You say, okay, so what uh, had you know? Usually, you, you tell them to come prepared to have like three different voices prepared for a role, and and then they come and they go. You know, I'll say, hey, what what were you thinking? And they'll say, hey, I was thinking this or this. And you say, okay, I like the middle voice, but maybe lose. Uh, you know, can you make it a little more this or a little less that? And that and that process literally takes about a minute. <laughs> you know, there's wow. not a lot of it's literally it's fast, you know, because these are professionals and and we're not really honing it. We're just spending a, a minute or two just to work on it. Even when I remember uh, we ran a show called Glenn Martin DDS and we hired I've worked with Phil, a guy named Phil Lamar. Phil is he he's a he's a fantastically talented voiceover actor. He works all the time. You know him as the guy in the back of. In Pulp Fiction, the guy who was in the back seat of the car who got his head blown off. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that, that was Phil, uh, but he funny. works all the time. <laughs> uh, he works all the time in animation because he's he's just an amazingly talented actor who can conjure up all these different voices from his lungs, from his chest, and they all sound different. He's got like you could have like twelve different or like a couple, several dozen different voices, and you'd be like, wait, this is all coming from the same person? Like they don't none of them sound alike. And so I remember we brought him in to do a part. Uh, for a character on uh, Glenn Martin. The character's name was Erasmus. And Erasmus was this old grizzled guy who ran a uh, um, uh, like a convenience store on, a, if I remember this right, he ran a convenience store on a, uh, at a camping ground. And this mm-hmm. camping ground was, you know, it was, legend has not that there was a, a werewolf that haunted this camp, camping ground. And Erasmus was this guy... And like everyone, you know, is a fun little legend. But Erasmus believed in the werewolf. And, you know, I think if I remember this right, Phil did a voice. And I go, that's great. But can you pull the crazy out? Because Erasmus sounded a little crazy. And I said, well, Erasmus isn't crazy. He's sane. He thinks everyone else is crazy. So he's confident. He's 100% certain that there's a werewolf out here. And the fact that no one else has seen it, well, or anyone's seen it, that, that's just a matter of time. And so, oh, he got it. Like, he, um, you, he, that's the kind of note you give. Just pull the crazy out, replace it with confidence. But the tone, the tone was Erasmus. It was, it was that kind of thing. 
And so that's, that's literally how long that process takes. <laughs> wow. You know, here's a quick note. Can you do it? And, you know, he's a pro. You could do it in, in half. And usually you work with, well, not usually, but often you'll work with voiceover t actors who this is what they do. You know, yeah. this is their craft and they just, they come, they go and they can, they can do it in a minute. And you never, uh, Dave Herman is another one where you heard, I worked with him a bunch on, uh, Brickleberry and as well as King of the Hill where he would like, again, he'd have several dozen voices and none of them sounded like they came from him. They all sounded like, you know, they're pulled out, there was like a magic trick that he pulled out of air. And so you would record them, uh, and you'd go, basically you put them in a room with the other actors, like say there's three actors in a scene, everyone's got a microphone. And you, I, I, this is how I would direct it. I would run it through, um, okay, we're going to run the scene two or three times. Keep it open. And just so people can feed off the energy, I'd give a couple of notes. But it's just to get a sense of the energy. And then I'd say, okay, you do sit down. We're going to take it line by line, you know, or maybe two, maybe one, two, two actors at the same time. It would depend. But you line by line, and basically you're saying to the actor, okay, read this line three different times. And uh, angrier. This time with more passion. This time uh, as if you're uh, standing at the edge of a pier, you know, where you have to yell at somebody on a boat. So you're, it's far away. You know, you kind of help them with that. And that's how you direct them. And it's very it's very playful and it's very uh, nitpicky. It's very uh, micromanagey. At, at least that's how I direct it. It's very micromanagey where you're basically mm -hmm. telling people, because I have a way I, I hear it in my head. And often they can come up with something better. And in, in that case, we'll use that version. But we're, we're, we're trying to get we're trying to get something specific and then I'm just trying to pull it out of them. And I'm and I'm you know, that's that's the directing process. And it's very you go line by line, move on to the next one f three or four times until you get it. And then you just keep and sometimes I get right in their face and I yell at them because that's the kind of energy I wanted from them. Or sometimes I would be seductive, you know, because I, I try to pull that out of them. And it was very much it reminded me of when I took uh, this is how I direct. It's how I how I took acting classes in college, which was very playful and experimental, where the teacher would get in your face and you do these wacky, ridiculous exercises. And you know, why are we doing these acting exercises? Well, because years from now you're going to be in an animated show, and this is what how we do it. So, and it's playful. And I would never direct anybody like that in live action. I would never I would never go line by line and try to hone each line. That's insulting. And it wouldn't even get a good performance because you get into their head and now they're really, the actor would have to yeah. really be struggling to try to remember all this stuff and you're taking them out of the scene. But in live action, I could just snip this thing. I can cut it together in editing and it'll, it'll sound great. It'll, I guarantee it'll sound great. Um, that, that was something I bumped against because that's something you talked about in the how, what is the job of being a showrunner? And you said you don't want to give a live reading, right? You don't want to do that. You want to get the best performance out of them. In a live action, for sure, some actors really, the really good actors um, really have no problem. If they're really secure, they have no, they don't get offended by line reading. And I've worked with someone, they say, just give me a line reading. Uh, and, I, and I would, and doesn't usually, sometimes they get it and sometimes it doesn't really work because they don't understand the intention behind it, which is why line readings are really, which is, they can be insulting and they cannot, they can be counterproductive. They, you know, so I tend not to do that. But sometimes in animation, it's okay. Uh, and again, it's very playful for the actors. I, I, every time I've directed an actor, I don't, well, I, most of the time, they always leave. When, when they're done, it's like an hour's worth of work. And they're like, that's it? Do you need anything else? Are you sure? Nothing? Are you, are you sure we can't do it again? I mean, because it's fun. Because I think that's why actors got into acting in the first place. Because it's, it's really, it's make-believe. If mm -hmm. this were live action... You know, a 150-pound actor is not going to get cast as a football player. They have to look the part. You have to be the right age, you know? Okay. But in animation, the, the spectrum is much broader of roles that they can play. I mean, they can play anything as long as they can, we hear it in their voice. And so I think that's why actors get into acting is like that whole make-believe thing. And so... Uh, that's why they leave. None of they, I don't, as far as I know, none of them have ever been offended by the way of direct. They're always, they, they said they tend to be like, that was great. Let's do some more. And I'm like, well, sorry, time is up. We got to yeah. get out to the next person. Um, so it's, it's very fun. It's very playful. Uh, it seems completely it? different than my experience in acting. You know, I've done the very traditional thing. I have an agent. I've received auditions. I've gone into the casting director's office. I've yeah. done my thing. Maybe they give me a second to take. They give me a little bit of, uh, direction. I do it again. I've had the call back with the producer 
for mm-hmm. you know Netflix shows where I sit down and I do it and then I get more direction from the producer who happened to be the director of that episode and they tell me this is this is the thing I'm looking for and then I attempt to do that um, and that's a very intense and very almost nerve-wracking experience because you do not know whether you're going to get that job unless you get offered the job like yeah. you don't know if you, if you're getting a call back until you get the call back Mm-hmm. And if you are, it's that night and you need to be in this place at this time. Um, or, you know, now it's a lot of self-tape stuff that you do against a wall. And it's very hard because you're not feeding off of someone else's energy. And so it's very interesting to hear you say that you're literally leaving that directing choice up to that. The, because the, it, the it's, low, it's low stakes, though, because first of all, the pay isn't they most of these people get paid to, uh, a scale, which is the minimum. And, and because, you know. It's not great money for a full day's worth of work, but for an hour's worth of work, it's it's really good. You're talking eight, mm-hmm. nine hundred thousand dollars. It's so it's at, you know for an hour's worth of work, who's not going to do that? Um, and it's easy. You don't have to go to hair, makeup. You don't have to go for a wardrobe fitting. You can show up in your sweatpants. No one cares. No one knows because it's only doing the audio. And so and so it's low stakes in terms of you know how much you're getting paid. And, and if we have to recast, and occasionally you do, occasionally the actor just isn't right. They're not doing it. They can't get it. So you recast it. So you record it again next week when you reco- when you you're renting you rent the sound the recording studio again next week. You're going to rent it anyway, and you just bring somebody else in and re-record it. It's it's a little bit of a pain because you know I have to do the job again, but it's not going to break the bank at, by any stretch. You just you know it's another eight nine hundred dollars whatever it is. It's not a lot of money. So right. As opposed to going through the process of costumes and fitting and makeup and hair and wardrobe, and then you go into putting them in front of the camera and it's just yeah, no if chemistry. it's and then you have to then right then you have to reshoot the damn thing and then you're talking about days of work. So this is just an hour of worth of work and and doesn't it barely cost anything. So yeah, we would trust the casting director a lot, uh, certainly a lot more. And uh, and, and and even then, if a, if an actor wasn't if I couldn't pull the like I prided myself, I was like I can I can pull the performance at anybody. But truthfully, I was working with great actors. I mean, I was always working with like really top actors. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you get somebody who you just couldn't pull the performance. They couldn't. They just couldn't do it. Maybe comedy wasn't their thing, and uh, and I would always say I I would I'd record them. I'd give them the same notes that I was giving everybody else, so that I wasn't going to insult them, so that they wouldn't know that I was going to recast them. I was mm-hmm. just, in other words, like I could have just said, "Okay, leave. I don't want to finish recording. The, the, you're terrible." But instead, I, I I'd go once I got. I realized that they weren't going to work out. I would still give them notes and I would still put the time and effort into them so that they wouldn't be embarrassed in front of everybody. So I wouldn't crush their spirit and they would have to go home with their tail between their legs. It's very kind of you. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I've had two experiences. One time, the first thing I did, um, I happened to know some casting directors in Santa Fe and they said, hey, would you mind self-taping for this? And it was for a regional commercial. And I, I just had my friend there and I just did it. And it was very playful and fun. And I got the gig and I went up and I went to perform it. And I, I went through the day. I was kind of the main part of this commercial. And we got to the end where there's this scene where they wanted to do it. And I didn't realize at the time what was happening. And now in retrospect, I 100% get what's happening. But I would do this shot and they'd be like, oh, can you do a little bit more aggro? And this is the first time I'd ever heard the term aggro for aggressive. So right. I didn't get the direction. And so I would just do what I thought they were saying. And then they give me that same direction over again. And it, four or five times. And then another guy came in and he tried to get it. He's like, more like what you did in the in the self-tape that we saw. And then finally they're pointed like, great, thank you so much. And that never aired. Yeah. Because I realized they paid me my 500 bucks and then they recast me. Yeah. Because I, didn't, I couldn't get what they wanted. Yeah. And part of that was for the folly of not being a, an actor and being asked to do something that was new to me. Part of it, I think, was the direction, to be fair. Like, I yeah. don't think they if were using telling me you're... something. I didn't understand the word that you were using. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, we like, probably should ask what acting meant. But... <laughs> I, I get that, right? Like, but, it, but when you're nervous and you're new. The right. other time, I went out to Santa Fe for another thing that, you know, I self-taped and I got called back for an audition with the director. And it was for a main part of a feature film. It was an indie film. And I did my thing at my performance and they gave me an instruction and they said, we want you to do it. Like, this is your friend. Be more jovial. Like you're seeing your good friend. And I did, I kid you not, the exact same thing I did in the previous take because Uh I had rehearsed that thing so many times. It was like locked in me. 
Yeah. And I just felt the room die at that moment. Yeah. And I left knowing I didn't get that deal. Like I, I yeah. wasn't going to be cast in that. Knowing how to take direction is a big deal. It's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. It's and it's nervous. And I think a lot of it was nervousness from this being a newer thing to me and not something that I like have high stakes in being an actor. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of these people, I should also mention that for in, in, in uh, voiceover, they get paid usually to do three voices. And then if you want them to do more, you got to pay them extra. That's uh, interesting. Yeah. So, but by three voices, it could also be like, hey, you're going to play this, the crazy serial killer. And then you're also going to play waiter number two. And waiter number two might only have a couple of lines or whatever. But, but, um, but sometimes, no, sometimes they pay vastly different parts and you'd really test their, their push their abilities of, uh, so that's why voiceover acting is a, is a little different. And, um, I mean, it's a great gig. It's a great gig. Uh, but yeah, you have to have those two different skill sets. You have to be able to, at least in comedy, be able to bring the funny or bring the real if it's drama. I guess there aren't too many drama animated shows, but bring the funny or, and then you have to have the ability to make different voices. And, and not, some actors just can't do that. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm talking about real famous, amazingly talented actors that I work with. They just can't do the other voices. So you just don't make them do other voices. You bring in somebody else. Right. Right. You know. So here's a question on that. I've, you know, you and I've had conversations about this too. There's a certain type of actor that in general bothers me. Like I find mm-hmm. them quite annoying. And there's a certain type of improv actor who is just doing nothing but silly voices all the time. Yeah. They're always and, on. Yeah. Yep. And and it it gets under my skin a little, and I feel like that's been very detrimental to me as someone who you know has an agent and wants to act and do those things because I feel like I'm judging them so harshly I don't allow myself to go there. And it sounds like in the world of voice acting, you need to be able to be playful and funny and not care about the judgment of other people. Oh, that's for actors. Period. Actors yeah. they put their they put themselves on the line every day. You know they have to do some incredibly bar- embarrassing things, and that's why you often see sometimes actors do st- things that we call are uh, in the writers' room. We would say eggy. That's eggy. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of times you'll see, you don't see it so much anymore, but you'll see like uh, for promos for a show on a sitcom, you see the actors all dancing together in a group, and that's kind of eggy. It's like why are you dancing? But actors do that because they don't have the inhibition. They've lost their inhibition. The that, shame. God, yeah, with God bless, because they need to, that you have to, yeah. to be a good actor. You have to have no inhib- you know, inhibition. You have to lose it. But also gets them in situations where they shouldn't be doing things like dancing on, <laughs> like <laughs> dancing on TV, looking like an idiot. But uh, God bless them. That's what you have to do to be an actor. Hi guys, it's Michael Jammin. I wanted to take a break from talking and talk just a little bit more. I think a lot of you people are getting bad advice on the internet. Many of you want to break into the industry as writers or directors or actors, and some of you are paying for this advice on the internet. It's just bad. And as a working TV writer and showrunner, this burns my butt. So my goal is to flush a lot of this bad stuff out of your head and replace it with stuff that's actually going to help you. So I post daily tips on social media. Go follow me, at Michael Jammin Writer. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok. And let's be honest, if you don't have time, like just two minutes a day towards improving your craft, it's not going to happen. So go make it happen for you, at Michael Jammin Writer. Okay, now back to my previous rant. This, you might get this too because I know you're a polyglot. You speak multiple languages, English, yeah. Italian, Spanish. Do yeah. you speak any other languages? That's enough. But I, yeah. I'd like to learn more. <laughs> yeah, as would I. And I speak Spanish fluently in English and I'd love to learn Portuguese and some of the others. And, you know, Italian's on my list of things to do uh-huh. as well. And that was something that I talked to people about. They're like, oh, I, I know words, but I've just, I, I can't speak. And it's like, well, you have to get rid of, and I struggle with this because there's this word in Spanish called vergüenza. Shame. Right? Which is almost like shame, right? Yeah. I have this shame that comes from speaking. I'm embarrassed of the judgment of other people for speaking this language that I know is not going to be good. And I just tell them, like, I que quitar la vergüenza. You have to get rid of your shame mm-hmm. because these people are just happy that you're practicing their language. They're yeah. excited by it. Yeah. They do not care. They want to help you. And yeah. it's really, you know, this talent of both, I would say, directing and being a voice actor there really are, it's a, it's a language skill. You have to get rid of that shame in order to be able to do that skill. Yeah. If you, 
Yeah, if you're feeling like you're gonna be judged, yeah, if that's then that's not the job for you, or you have to somehow get rid of that that, that mm-hmm. fear of being judged. You have to be free, man. That's why they make you do these crazy, ridiculous exercises in acting class to walk around like a duck or whatever. It's to get rid of the shame, you know. Yeah. So that there's a reason why they do these these exercises, you know, to bring yeah. out the best, in you. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things you have written here is that this is why writers should study acting, yes. actors should study writing, and directors should study both. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I first moved to L.A., I was fortunate enough to go to acting classes with our mutual friend, Jill Sholin, right? Yeah, um, she's great. She's she's incredible. Look her up on IMDb, watch some of her stuff. She's incredibly talented. And that was a very eye-opening experience for me as a person just to get really used to feeling things I didn't want to feel. Like yeah. We've talked about another podcast, negative feelings, anger, frustration, a lot of things I'd been suppressing for a long time in my life. And... Um, that, there was a piece of advice you gave me. I remember you did a comedy workshop and I had to play like a white supremacist, <laughs> which, yeah. which was really fun for me to do as a bald white man with a red beard. Yeah. Um, but afterwards, I remember you, you sent me a note and you just said, I'm, it's a good thing you're taking acting classes. It will just make you a better writer. Mm-hmm. I, I was yeah. wondering if you could speak to that. Well, yeah, I mean, it's acting and writing are the same thing. They're just two sides of the same coin. They really are. And, and my daughter Lola's taking acting classes now, and she, she comes back, we talk about it, and she uses different words, but we, we I, synonyms, synonyms. Like her acting teacher will teach you, oh, intention, what is your intention? Mm-hmm. And then I say, well, what is your goal? It's the same thing. It's their synonyms. But so, and it's funny how much, you know, how much overlap there is between the two crafts because it's really the same thing. It's really like, you know, and so when, when I'm writing the scene, I act it out. And when you're acting a scene, if you if you understand the writing process, like Jill, who we just mentioned, she came over a few weeks ago uh, because she's working on a play that she's writing herself. And she we were talking about it and I was kind of helping her out. And uh, and then I told her, because she's not a writer, she's, a, she's an excellent actor, but she's never yeah. really doesn't, hasn't done much writing. And so I kind of told her how I would approach the piece as a writer. And I go, this is what this is what writers do. And after we had this long conversation for about an hour, and Jill worked all the time in the 80s. I'm talking about big movies. She was the star of lots of big movies. So, side of buses, right? Like buses with yeah. her face on them. Yeah, yeah. Worked all the time. And she said, if I had known this then, if I would known what writing, if I understood writers, what writing was back then, she would have booked even more jobs. Yeah. And then she booked a lot of jobs. And she would have booked even more because now you're seeing you're looking at the material through the through the lens of the writer, and if you can give the writer what the writer wants, you're gonna get the role. Mm-hmm. You know, if you understand what they want, you'll get the role. So, mm. or, or you have a better chance of getting it at least. So, uh, yeah. yeah, it's all the same thing. And I, I've taken acting classes, and I'm not a great actor, but I understand it at least. And uh, I've studied improv, same thing. Um, done stand up, anything that lowers the inhibition that gets you just to be more comfortable. And then another thing is when you're talking to actors, when you're directing them, like I've, I, I know I know writers who are not good directors and they should, they have no business talking to actors. They just have no business because they're just, they. you could see the look of confusion on the actor's face. They don't know how to communicate. They kind of, they're inadvertently insulting them by saying things and, and they're just not getting a good performance out of them. But it's because they don't know that language yet. So if you can speak their language, you'll get a better performance out of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, you, you also by the way, know, go ahead. Uh, but by the way, so I became a director only because I was the showrunner, only because I was the head writer. So head writer directs the actors. And so it's never really my intention to be a director, but I think I'm a decent director because I, I'm a good writer. So like if you want to be a director, study, study writing, study acting, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's great. I think it's incredible feedback, especially as a director, right? Because... You have to take the words off the page, understand the intention of the writer, and then yeah. do that job. And as an actor, you need to be able to, you know, if you're going to direct actors, that's the job, right? And I was told early on in film school, there's two types of directors. There are people who are camera people, and then there mm-hmm. are actor people. And really, camera people, they're really more cinematographers, right? They care yeah. a lot more about the picture, whereas the director really is caring more about the story because that's what the actor is doing. They're bringing out the story. It's funny that you learned that because I did a post uh, a few days a few days ago, I think, on TikTok or Instagram. I post there every day, by the way, if you if you want to hear my tips like, at Michael Jammin Writer. But I did a I did a post 
saying that there's two different kinds of directors and, and, and you know, camera directors and acting directors. And it's unusual to find someone who's equally good at both skills. Mm. Uh, but I did, and that, that was just my observation. I didn't realize that other people had say, I say that yeah. as well. So, yeah, I think, I think I had the, I was fortuitous enough to have indie directors teaching some of the classes at my film school. Right. So they were one of those two people and they kind of taught from the perspective. I think the, my directing teacher taught me that and he was a classically trained actor and then went to film school. And so he was like, you know, this is what I've seen and you both matter. Both are important, but the acting is more important because the cinematography is just meant to heighten or, better tell the story that's happening with the actor that's and that was a, a question someone asked me was like hey how come how come at you you know actors sometimes get to direct episodes and, and you see this sometimes on season four yeah, of a uh, show john, john john krasinski um the office he yeah. directed one of my favorite episodes and i just noticed it as we've been going back through it and it's usually it's not it doesn't usually happen until the show's a hit at which point they either negotiate for five. it or they ask they ask for it hey i'd like to direct and people think, well, you know, what do they know? Well, the actor may not. First of all, they've been on set all this time, so they should have been paying attention to how other directors work. So that's a, you know, they should have learned a lot. But also, a trained actor knows how to should know how to speak to other actors. So they should have a huge advantage, at least in that acting skill. They should definitely know that part of the equation. And if they don't know the camera work, then then they rely on the DP, the director of photography, to help them. So yeah. it's not like, crazy to think that an actor should become a director. You know. Yeah. So this this note I thought was very interesting because you said here that when you're directing, you don't look at the actor; you're listening to their voice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? And, on, and that's on because animation, of, that is because yeah. in animation, the voice, the vocal performance is the most important thing because you're going to animate the rest of it, right? Well, you'll animate you'll animate the faces. Like an actor has three tools, right? They can you hear their voice; they can act for their voice but they have facial expressions and then they have body language and all three are super important in live action. They, you know, they're all, they, they mean everything, but in animation, you're not going to be able to draw the face. You'll never, the, you'll never get good acting face, the great acting, facial acting in animation, no matter how good it is. It's just, you, you, it really isn't there. You know, you, the light, you won't see the life in the eyes. Same thing with the, uh, the, um, you know, the body positioning and, you know, stuff like that. So, you really have to hear it all in the voice. And I remember the very first time I directed on Glenn Martin, I uh, you know did the whole session. And I came back to the writer's room and Sievert said, my partner said, how'd it go? And I go, it went great. It, and I really thought it went great. And then we listened to the cut of, you know, a few days later and it was no good. The cut mm-hmm. was like, and and I was embarrassed because I, I directed it and I directed everyone wrong. And it was because I was looking at their faces and I and all these actors, they're great actors. They were just giving me the performance in their faces. And so then after that, I went back and said, OK, I, I would no longer look at the actors. It was it, it was probably rude, but I kept my face down at the script and I was just listening to it. And I would say to them, I'd give them a note like I can hear your I, I can see you playing jealousy. I just can't hear it in your voice. Mm-hmm. And so then, then they said, OK, got it. And then they would just dial it up a little bit in their voice. And so and that just comes from an actor who. Is either being directed poorly, which I did, or uh, is an actor who doesn't do a lot of voiceover action, animation, you know, acting. So, yeah, oh, that's a great note. So, so this note stood out to me, and I think that's that's a very important thing because the big takeaway from Jill's acting class was energy. Like, you just have to have a ton of energy, and the energy yeah. is what's going to come through. You can't just kind of phone it in. You have to be engaged and have that heightened energy to play yeah. up those parts, and that seems very particularly true in comedy. Dude, I don't want to say which show. I just had this conversation with my wife last night. We're watching a show, and uh, I don't want to, because I don't like bad mouthing other shows on TV. I love the show, but um, my wife was an actor for many years. That's when I met her. She was an and actor. a voice actor. She, and she a voice was actor. Angry Beavers, I Roll Monsters. Mm-hmm. Did she do some stuff on Glenn Martin as well? Yeah, yeah. I put her in stuff, but she was also on Friends and yeah, Ron Friends and Club. Seinfeld. She, Seinfeld, yeah, tons of stuff. Yeah. And so we're watching this show, and. And halfway through it, like she never, she didn't like this one actor in the show. All the other actors she thinks are doing great, but she doesn't like the performance of this one actor. And I'm like, you're being too hard. I think he's fine. And then about halfway through it, I realized that she was right. And I go, he's not in the same show as everybody else is. Hmm. And she goes, that's exactly it. That's was fine. She goes, thank God you finally understood it. Because that's what it was. He was doing a different show 
than everyone else. Everyone was doing this high energy show, kind of big and broad and, and funny and big. And he's playing, a, he's holding the cards close to his chest and he's playing it very internally, which would have been fine on a different show. Mm-hmm. Everyone else is doing this show and he's doing a different show. Yeah, and, tone, right? Yeah, it's, he wasn't matching their energy. And mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And this is an experienced actor, so I, I don't know who helped him make that decision. I, I just think it's the wrong decision, though. So Well, to kind of wrap up my thoughts on, on this, you know, at the Sundance Director's Labs, I had the opportunity to go there as a translator, Spanish-English translator, and I got to sit there and with the people directing, the different directors kind of coaching, supervising things. You know, Anthony Mackie was there at kind of coaching them on how to work with actors, which was really cool. A um, bunch of really high-level, very talented people, very well-known names kind of coaching through these different things, teaching like here are principles to kind of loosen up through method acting. Here are some other things you do as a director. One of the big things that really stood out to me was uh, the guy teaching the directing stuff. He, and I'm not using names because it's not my place to talk about who was there. I guess I'd talk about Anthony Mackie, but um, mm-hmm. he, he gave this note. He said, when you're directing, there's a, mis- there's a common mistake people make where they sit in video village and they just watch the monitors. Mm-hmm. And that is typically the camera guy. That's the guy who's obsessed with cinematography. Right. You, as the director, have a responsibility to get the best performance from the actor to the camera. So the best place for you to be is right next to the camera. Because if not you, they're, they're going to be looking to you to judge how they're doing and getting that feedback. And if not you, it's going to be the camera operator or the boom mm, operator. That's a good so point. So who, who do you want directing these people? Do you want it to be the camera guy or do you want it to be the boom operator? Right. That's so you better be right next to the camera, looking at what the camera's getting. And there's there's a can't there's you monitor on the camera, yeah. so you can stand there and see. And it was a very eye opening experience. And, and what I'm hearing you say is when you're directing voiceover, your ears are the equivalent of that, right? Yeah. You're not the but, face is the monitor in Video Village, and the mm-hmm. your ears are looking down the camera. But it's interesting that you even say that for. Because on all my live action shows, when the director is not at the uh, in the video village, we're looking at the monitor and they're on set. That's the kind of that's why the job of the showrunner is in video village. That's why we're there saying, did we get the shot or not? Because it's not entire. The director, if they're trying to if they're there on set, they're trying to get that performance. They're trying to give the feedback to the director, the actress, so they can get that performance. But they may not be able to tell, even if they have that little mon- that little monitor does exist. It's small. It's a little hard to see. It's like, yeah. honestly, it's like three inches wide. So it's a little hard to see on it. It's smaller than a phone. Or, but So that's why the job of the show winner is in video footage to actually make sure we got it on camera, you know? Cause it, yeah. And if you're not paying attention, and it's very easy not to. If you're on set for 14 hours a day, it's very easy to zone out. So I was always on set and I was always uh, marking line marking, you know, the coverage. Um, do we have the right looks? And by that, I mean, is the person... This is a whole different topic of conversation, but jumping the line and making sure that you have the right looks and which direction the characters. And that's a whole different, that's, a, that's like doing math. Yeah, that's like head. directing, like full on directing intensity, right? Yeah. But that's that was part of our job is to actually make sure that we, that, yeah, the director might have gotten the performance. That's great. I want to make sure we have it on camera though. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, cool. I think it's a, again, another great episode and very eye opening. Um, you know, one of the things I think is very cool about what you've been able to do with your following is it's not just people interested in writing, but a lot of people interested in directing and a lot of actors seem to get a lot of value out of stuff yeah. you're putting out. So I think this is a great episode for three people, right? The writer who we're primarily servicing with the podcast because we're mm-hmm. saying like, here's how, you, here's how you should be conveying your intention so clearly that they cannot misunderstand on the page, right? You have to get that across and less is more. The, mm-hmm. the more brief you are, the better. The other side of this are the actors who can get a better understanding of what someone in a hiring position and a directing position is actually looking for. Because it's, it's kind of ethereal. It's a lot of in the moment feeling and playing off of someone else. But you're not doing that in a line reading inside of, or not a line reading, but like an individual session in animation. Right, right, right. yeah. And then third, I'd say, is the director. Because it effectively like, hey, this is the job ultimately of getting the the writing portrayed through the actor to get yeah. the story right so i so if, that's why i say yeah if you're in, you have to study all three study acting writing and directing and you'll be you'll be golden it's all the same thing anyway so it helps right. to learn different different angles 
Cool. But okay. Well, uh, on that note, I would say we do service those three different groups on the watch list, which you've heard mm-hmm. us talk about. And if you were new to the podcast, the watch list is a weekly email that's sent out. Uh, it talks to writers, directors, and creatives. Our writers, actors, and creatives, and some of the creative stuff is for directors. Some of the acting stuff is also for directors. Um, and so I recommend everyone go sign up for that. It just goes out once a week. We don't share it with anyone else. Your information is secure in one one feed. We're not spamming you with anything else. And we've seen really good feedback from people on that. Yeah. So if you want to get on the watch list, go to michaeljammon.com slash watch list. Enter your email. We'll send you an email once a week. Every Friday, our top, our top tips for actors, writers, and creatives. So yeah, go sign up. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. This has been an episode of Screenwriters Need to Hear This with Michael Jamin and Phil Hudson. If you'd like to support this podcast, please consider subscribing, leaving a review, and sharing this podcast with someone who needs to hear today's subject. For free daily screenwriting tips, follow Michael on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Michael Jamin Writer. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Phil A. Hudson. This episode was produced by Phil Hudson and edited by Dallas Crane. Until next time, keep writing.